This story happened to me over 20 years ago, back in the summer of 1992. It was the summer break between my first and second year of college, and I was working that summer on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. My father worked for the park service at the time, and could pull some strings and get my siblings and I jobs working in restaurants at national parks around the country. That summer, I went to work at the Bright Angel Lodge on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. For some backstory as to what was going on in Arizona at the time, from 1990 to 1991, a man named Danny Ray Horning went on a bank robbing spree across the western U.S. that ended up with him getting arrested in Arizona in 1991. He was basically given a life sentence and put in prison near Phoenix, Arizona. He was also wanted in California for murder, but since he basically had a life sentence in Arizona, they decided not to extradite him there. In 1992, Horning put on a doctor's coat he found at the prison and basically walked right out of it. He then proceeded to disappear, with authorities having no idea where he went. The first reported sighting of him was when he kidnapped a couple in Flagstaff, Arizona, and they drove to the Grand Canyon. After arriving in the Grand Canyon, Danny Ray tried to kidnap a family, and that went wrong and he ended up getting into a high-speed chase slash shootout with the Park Service police before ditching the car and fleeing into the woods. Danny had been in the military and had received survival training, so he knew how to survive off the land. At any rate, he eluded the police for the next month and a half by hiding out in the surrounding forest. Some 400 state and federal agents descended on the area to search for him, this made life interesting while living in the park. Helicopters would fly over the forest looking for him, and agents would patrol the area with assault rifles and canines. If you wanted to leave the park, you usually had to go through three police checkpoints. At one point, he was spotted in the area of my employee dorm, so they brought police with canines to search each room. The restaurant I worked at had a huge kitchen and a long hallway on one end leading out the back. At the back of the hallway were the walk-in coolers. Within my hours, I would get off of work at 2.30 a.m. And at this time, there would only be two other dishwashers and myself, as well as another man who would come in to start prepping for breakfast. The kitchen was massive, and there was hardly any way to notice if anyone else walked into the back hallway. The manager and cooks noticed some things missing from the walk-in coolers at one point, and they checked surveillance video. They saw someone who appeared to be Danny Ray sneaking in and going into one of the walk-in coolers and getting food and then leaving. Even with all this going on, I just kind of kept about my business and didn't really think I would have a run-in with him or anything. I also didn't really have access to a TV or read the papers much, so I didn't know much about what was going on with the whole situation other than by word of mouth. In these jobs, he would usually start out working in the kitchen as a dishwasher or in the restaurant as a busser. I started working out as a dishwasher, and I worked the evening shift starting at 6 p.m. and ending at 2.30 a.m. When I would get off work at 2.30 a.m., I would have to walk back to the employee housing because the public shuttle had stopped running hours before. The employee housing was about two miles from the restaurant, and I had two options on how I could walk there. The first was to walk along the main road through the park that took you past the visitor center, then by the general store. It wasn't very pretty, as it was just a dirt path that was basically alongside the road, but it was a bit safer, as it was patrolled by park rangers. The second option was to walk along the Grand Canyon Rim Trail for about a mile, before connecting up with another trail that would take you through the woods and dump you out at the visitor center along the main road. This option was much prettier, as you would walk along the edge of the Grand Canyon and the forest, but it was also somewhat scary because it was pitch black out with no light unless the moon was out. I liked to walk this route because it was so beautiful with the stars looking so bright, and also the big empty black void of the canyon right next to you. Going this way also made me nervous, because I'd heard about there being mountain lions in the park, and also who knows what kind of person that I might run into 
out for a late night stroll along the canyon. That night, I decided to walk along the rim trail as I had my flashlight with me. I made it along the trail without incident and connected with the trail that cuts over to the visitor center. This trail is a little scary as it cuts through pretty thick woods for about half a mile before arriving at the visitor center. This trail is usually pitch black at this time of night with not even moonlight penetrating through the thick trees. I walked the trail until I was almost at the visitor center and remembered that behind the visitor center is an amphitheater and I'd never seen it before so I wanted to go check it out to see what it looked like. Even though it was now about 3 a.m. and pitch black out, the amphitheater is a short walk through the woods before you arrive at it. I walked over to it and walked around it and up onto the stage, the whole time shining my flashlight around to get a look at it. It's kind of a crude amphitheater, with just basically an elevated platform surrounded by benches and with the forest surrounding the whole thing. I was shining my flashlight around the area when suddenly I hear rustling in the surrounding trees. I get a bit nervous, knowing that it's not the wind, as there was no wind that night, and I think that it might be an animal or something. I hear it again, so I shine my flashlight out into the forest to see if I can see anything. I stepped off the stage and walk in the direction I heard it coming from while shining my flashlight around through the trees. At this point, I was past all the benches of the amphitheater and entering the surrounding forest. I hear the rustling again. It was getting louder, so I knew I was getting closer to it. Now, I grew up in the mountains of Colorado and have come across animals in the woods before. When they make noise, it's usually pretty constant, such as when they're moving around and you might hear twigs breaking or such. But this time, I wasn't hearing that. This was a much more controlled rustling noise that would happen every couple of minutes. I keep walking further into the forest and shining my flashlight, when suddenly I briefly see something shiny through the trees. I walk towards it and get closer. I see what looks like a large bag laying on the forest floor. I keep walking towards it and all of a sudden see it rustle as if something is inside of it or underneath it. Finally, I'm only about five or six feet from it. I see it several feet long and shiny on the outside. I keep my flashlight on it, and at this point, I'm just inching towards it. I must know what's inside of it. Suddenly, the bag rolls towards me, and a face pops out of it. I shine my flashlight at the ground for a second, and it is at this point that I realize that it's someone sleeping out here in the forest, wrapped up in a blanket, and what looks like a thermal blanket on top of that. They must just be camping out here. It's the face of a man, and he has reddish blonde hair and a mustache. His eyes are closed, so it looks like he's sleeping. Behind the bag, I see a backpack. I quickly shut off my flashlight so as not to wake him if he is sleeping, and I start slowly backing up. I get all the way back to the trail, continuing to hear the rustling occasionally the whole time. Then I walk the main trail up past the visitor center and eventually get back to the housing without incident. But I was somewhat spooked the whole time and I kept constantly checking to make sure that I was not being followed. I was somewhat spooked by this the next couple of days but then I realized that it wasn't that unusual to see people sleeping in their cars or campers in the parking lots or maybe even out in the woods in a tent, though that's against the park rules because they would arrive late to the park or just didn't want to pay the high hotel rates. What did strike me as weird was that when I had seen people camping before, they were usually close to their car and would have a tent or other gear with them. This situation seemed weird because it looked like this guy only had a backpack and a blanket. Also, the nearest parking lot was at the visitor center, and I didn't see any cars there that night. At any rate, I just kind of shrugged it off. I even walked by the spot the next day, and I didn't see anything or any evidence he was there. 
This happened just a few days after it was made official that Danny Ray Horning had entered the park, but I hadn't seen what he looked like yet. This was also long before the park became overrun with authorities searching for him. Then one day, I happened to see a wanted picture of him, and I was shocked to see that he had blonde hair and a mustache. The wanted notice also said that he was last seen with reddish blonde hair after recently dyeing it. I'm pretty certain that the man I saw that night was him. Maybe he was asleep. Maybe he was just pretending to be. I'll never know. Even though he never hurt any civilians during his escape, he did kidnap several to use as hostages, so who knows what he would have done. At any rate, he was eventually caught after he kidnapped two women and forced them to drive out of the park. They managed to drive through two police roadblocks after the police failed to recognize him and waved them on. He then tied the women to a tree near Sedona and fled in their car. The women escaped and called the police, who then spotted the car, and another high-speed chase slash shootout happened before he fled again into the woods. The next morning, a man spotted him in his backyard drinking from his hose and he called the police who searched the area, but they couldn't find him. The morning after, a policeman went back to that house to research it, and they found him sleeping under the gazebo, and then they arrested him. He was also extradited back to California and tried for the earlier murder, and today he is currently sitting on death row in San Quentin Prison. I was 20, and I'm female. It was on a motorway in the southwest slash west midlands of England, 1990. So I was what was known at the time as a crusty, though I read that they're called gutter punks in the US. I had dreadlocks, listened to anarcho-punk, and dressed in rags. I was a softie from the countryside by birth, but a couple of years in the violent Nottingham squatter scene had hardened me up no end. I had left the squats and joined the New Age Travelers, and we were as aggressive as a bunch of heavy drinking thieves as you'd be likely to meet anywhere in the UK at that time. For this reason, I was fearless, but you and a safe upbringing made me stupid when I thought I was streetwise. As was my habit, I'd taken myself off on my own and gone back to my hometown. Now I was hitchhiking the breadth of the country to get back to the site where my friends were. I remember waiting for my next lift at a service station when this battered old three-wheeled van pulled up. It was filthy and didn't look very pleasant, but it was going in my direction, so I was pleased. The driver seemed okay, a bit serious and intense I suppose, but he said he could take me to the other side of Birmingham, which was very convenient for me. He was very distinctive looking. This was the start of the 90s, but he looked like my dad did during the 70s, and my dad was old-fashioned his whole life. The man had thick black hair and a bit of a quiff and sideburns. He was also very tanned, like he worked outdoors a lot. He was lean, with dark eyebrows. I remember him so well, because he looked like my dad and also my uncle. Maybe this was why I didn't feel less at ease with him. So we start along the motorway, and it all seemed fine. I was probably chatting like an idiot as usual, and I remember glancing in the back of the van and seeing a heap of junk in there, bulky and dirty, and some of it covered with a black cloth. He saw me looking at it and said it was equipment for a puppet show, which I found bizarre and incongruous. He didn't look like a children's entertainer. He was more child catcher than friendly clown. Along the road a bit, and he started asking me how often I hitch. I let him know it's routine for me. He says, but don't you get scared? No, not really, I replied, but the guy won't leave it. You must get scared. No, I really don't. Why don't you get scared? I can handle myself, I told him. And so he goes on and on and on. 
He insists I must be scared, and asks me if I'm scared now, and also how I would know I would be able to handle being attacked, and I'm getting really irritated. I'm a bit freaked out, because it seems like he wants me to be scared, and I'm giving the wrong answer, but mostly annoyed, because the conversation is going in circles. Eventually, when he asks why, I reply, I don't get scared because I carry a knife. This was true, but only a little lock knife for day-to-day -day purposes. Well, that stopped the line of questions. In fact, it stopped the whole lift. The guy swerved into the hard shoulder at the side of the road and said, I'll have to drop you off here. Oh, I was surprised and a bit pissed off to be left here, but I got out and grumbled to myself as he drove off. Cars aren't allowed to stop on the hard shoulder, and people certainly aren't allowed to walk along it. But what could I do? I stuck my thumb out and started to walk. About 15 minutes later, a police car pulled up and told me off for being there, but kindly gave me a lift across to the far side of Birmingham to a safe and legal hitching spot, where I was picked up by a minibus full of pagan students who took me right to their traveler site. Years went by. I left the sights and the squats, had a baby, got a job, and the only time I thought about this guy was when exchanging hitching stories with other people. This was my second favorite story, behind the one about the Christian who drove at 100 miles per hour on the wrong side of the road because God will save me, whilst I screamed, I'm an atheist, he won't save me. After I would tell that story, I'd mention the mad puppeteer and his annoying questions. It wasn't until a couple of years later that I realized the possible danger I had been in. I was watching a show called Crime Watch on the BBC where they appeal for information and they had a special on the serial killer, Peter Tobin, trying to track his movements through the years. I follow serial killer stories with interest, so I'd heard of him and had seen his pictures as an old man. Then, when they showed pictures of him through the years and, holy shit, there he was. The one I referred to as the Mad Puppeteer. The picture matched. The time matched. Just how he looked in the late 80s, early 90s. Just how he looked when he murdered hitchhiker Dina McNicole in 1991. I work for the criminal justice system, so I have level-headed colleagues. Well, mostly, and I told people at work. They agreed I should ring the crime watch number. If it was nothing, it could do no harm. If it was something, it might really help. I rang the crime watch number and said, It's probably nothing but... A few days later, they rang back and arranged to take a statement. A police officer came to my house and wrote down everything. A few days later... A second officer came to my workplace to get more information and to photocopy a diary I kept back then. Frustratingly, I said nothing about this lift in the diary. That's how little I thought I was in danger. The Crime Watch website updated to mention the three-wheeled van and now is reported in some biographies as fact. People ask me now if I truly believe that was Peter Tobin who gave me that lift. I can never be sure, but I think in my mind, I'm 75% sure that I survived a serial killer. At the very least, I now realize how stupid and naive I was, feeling so tough and so fearless. Sometimes, when I think of what could have happened, I just feel cold and sick. Because of my job, I realize how many psychopaths there are out there. And I'm just relieved it wasn't my parents searching for answers about one of his victims. This has left me feeling extremely shook, and I'd love some opinions, especially from someone with experience. Last year, I had a very strange experience in a national forest out in California. I was by myself on a road trip with my dog. 
I was driving pretty far into the Medicino National Forest. I like to camp in national parks and forests because it's isolated, so my dog can roam and they're free of charge. A trade-off for sketchy and rough drives into the parks sometimes, and lack of service and assistance. Anyway, I was driving up this dirt road, kind of curling up a mountain around maybe 5pm. It was very nice out, sunny and warm, with a slight breeze. Nothing serious happened, but I felt extremely uncomfortable driving into the area, and that feeling did not let up. Driving up the mountain, I felt like I shouldn't stay there, and I even texted my boyfriend about it for as long as I could before my phone completely lost service. I was looking for a sign of another person having been around the area lately, but I didn't see anything. I pulled over and got out of my car with my dog to look over the edge, and I noticed a dead squirrel and some broken glass mixed in with a dirt and gravel road. Yuka, my dog, starts to growl slightly. She is vocal, but I've almost only ever seen or heard her growl at or with other dogs. I did see her growl at a possum once, so it could be something she smelled maybe. This place continued to make me feel quite on edge, but I pride myself in being an independent traveler and backpacker, so I decided to continue at least a bit further with my grumbling pup to see if I could find a good place to camp. I continue to notice more dead animals. Keep in mind, no one is going to be going more than 5 to 10 miles per hour up this thing, and that's if there's anyone even there. I hear men's voices, they sound close, and I think I should call out to them. So I stop my car, but then kind of freeze up and feel like I shouldn't. I can't really make out what they're saying. I don't see any sign of people anywhere. I get back in my car and continue to slowly drive forward and cautiously look for where the voices could be coming from. I've never run into other people in a national park or forest when I've gone this deep in. The unsettling feeling grows about the voices, which have sort of come and gone a few times, and I give up and begin to turn my car around. I honestly don't remember how Yuka was acting on the way down. I was scared and focused on getting out of there. I just distinctly remember being surprised at her grumbling when we were standing outside of my car. Kind of dangerously quickly, I went back down the mountain, not seeing any sign of anyone. I decided to spring for a luxury and get a hotel for the night. I figured I was just fine. Huge and open spaces can be intimidating, I told myself, and the voices could have been echoing from somewhere far off, and they just sounded close. Animals die, glass gets broken. Nothing happened, cool. But I remember this place. It sticks with me. Whenever I'm watching scary movies, if I'm walking my dogs in the woods at night, Nothing compares to the feeling I had driving up that mountain, and it's honestly kind of interesting to me, as well as frightening. I recently happened across some information, as well as some Native American lore that made me feel extremely uneasy. Fast forward a year, I've mentioned this place to a few people and the haunting vibes it gave me, but nothing much more. I've googled the national park once, and I didn't see anything. But to be fair, I didn't look much. I like scary movies and things of that nature, hence my fascination in this little event. So my boyfriend and I were coming up on finishing our road trip just yesterday. We were in Wyoming for a wedding. There were only two to three hours left, and the sun had set, so we decided to listen to some scary podcasts and YouTube videos. We went from the No Sleep podcast to The X-Files and ended up on a true stories video dealing with Native American lore. I'm half paying attention, petting my dog, playing Pokemon on an emulator, and I hear the narrator mention Wendigos. Very briefly, he says what they are, and casually mentions that they can mimic voices. I mean it when I say the most horrible chills I have ever had in my life crawl down my spine, and I stare at my boyfriend and ask him if he remembers that national forest I was freaked out about last year. He says he does, and he reminds me that he texted me that I was probably close to a Wendigo. 
I remember him saying that, but I didn't know much about their lore, and I thought he was just being funny, like, yeah, Bigfoot is probably stalking you, or some other dad joke. And he was like, no, I mean I was mostly joking, but I said it specifically because you said you were hearing voices that you could not find a trace of. I feel strange as fuck, and I start googling Wendigos and whatever else. They are allegedly able to mimic human voices, and they would live in that sort of area. It all matched up. Obviously there's a ton of questionable info out there, but I tried to find more reputable websites and authentic experiences. I then specifically looked up missing persons in the area, and the first headline that catches my eye is, Another family goes missing in Mendocino. And I went through different websites and news articles of people going missing, but they are all a little hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remembered looking up the forest about a year ago and didn't see anything, and realized these stories didn't seem to be talked about much, which also piqued my intuition. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past eight years have gone missing and not been found, on top of many which are found dead. It just has my intuition super spiked. Remembering how unsafe I felt and how much I wanted to get out of there terrifies me, and I felt so uneasy about what I was hearing, and still do to this day. My dog and I are very close. She was a stray that started following me one day and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica. So her little growls along the way makes me feel like there was something wrong. Even though it was just a storytelling video, those stories originate from somewhere. I have done a lot of solo traveling, both in and out of the country, and I have never had such a bad feeling, on top of seeing an unnecessary amount of dead animals in a national forest which just seemed strange. I don't think I'll be doing more solo travel unless it's around civilization. Does anyone know about authentic Native American lore? Or has anyone else had a kind of inexplicable experience like this? Extra points if you've had bad vibes in Mendocino National Forest from a Wendigo. This was years ago when I was 23. My husband and I had recently rented a house in a new town. We had just left a church about two years, or maybe less before, because it had started becoming a cult. I had a lot of knowledge about the Bible at this point, and I was kind of searching spiritually for something. My husband was at work. I was home that day with my sons. They were two and three. It was pouring out. I got a knock on my door, which was a sliding glass door so I could see the people on the outside. Immediately, I thought, more Jehovah Witnesses with watchtower pamphlets. It was a white woman in a dress suit and a tall, at least six-foot, Asian male in a suit. The man was holding a briefcase. We lived really close to all the other houses in the neighborhood, and I had people that lived above us on the top floor, so I felt safe to go to the door and talk to them. I was about to tell them, no thanks, but they said they were from the World Mission Society Church of God, and they wanted to tell me all about Mother God. This piqued my interest. If it wasn't raining, I would have talked to them through the screen door, but I felt bad, and I let them into my house. I know, so stupid. I definitely regretted it. We go into the living room where my boys are playing. The lady gets the creepiest smile and is staring at my kids. She says, I love kids. I really want kids of my own, but I wasn't blessed with being able to. Then she starts telling me about their church and how Jesus or Mary, I can't quite remember, was reborn in South Korea. She stops suddenly and tells me the guy can take my children into their room and play with them so we don't have to be distracted. She then says something to him in another language, I'm guessing Korean. This is when I knew I was an idiot and should not have let them in. I said, absolutely not. My kids are fine right here. 
she tried to convince me we needed quiet to pray to the mother. I was like, I don't give a fuck. I don't know you people. Then the guy opens the briefcase. It's got little shot glasses and a glass pitcher of some purple liquid in it. They said that my children and I had to make communion right now to save our souls. I said, no way. I think it's time for you guys to leave. Her whole face changed and she got angry. She started yelling, You and the children will burn in hell if you don't drink this now. I stood up and said, Get out of my house now. Her face changed back to the creepy smile and she said, Okay, we're gonna take the children with us to our church. There's tons of other kids there. I'll send you the address once we get there. I went into panic mode. I was already standing in front of my kids at this point. I started screaming, You're not touching my kids. Get the fuck out now. As I was walking towards them, she says, We need to save the children. At this point, the guy she's with seems kind of clueless, like he's just waiting for her to tell him to do something. I'm screaming, Get out, over and over again. I'm threatening to punch her. I know I can't take the guy on, so I'm trying to think of how to get them out. A light bulb goes off in my head. I grab my phone from my pocket and yell, I'm calling the police. They turn around and ran out the back door. I watched them run down the little street until I couldn't see them anymore. I told my husband when he got home from work. He was pissed that I let them in, understandably. The next night I'm at work and my husband is at home with the kids. Our house had a ton of windows, and besides our bedrooms, we didn't have curtains on them yet. He had just put the kids to bed. He's watching TV in the living room. He sees faces looking in the windows. He goes to the window and says, Who the fuck are you? They mention my name and say, Is Rachel here? She told us to come back tonight. We need to talk to her. My husband replies, I know who the fuck you are. Get off of my property. They go around to the next window and look in. My husband goes outside, trying to look for them, and they start to run. He yelled after them that he was calling the police. I don't remember if we made a police report or called them. It was a long time ago. I've never seen them again, but I was scared for the longest time. I'm pretty sure it was a child trafficking thing, as well as a weird cult. And now I don't answer the door, unless it's to someone I know. My mom has told me this story for years, and I always thought it was cool slash so creepy. This happened two days before Ted Bundy was finally caught. For background on Ted Bundy if you need it, he was a serial killer who brutally murdered many, many female victims. Always young and pretty, which is exactly what my mother was. Just under two months before this story takes place, he went into a sorority house at Florida State University and murdered two girls in there and brutally beat two others. Then, he went to a house nearby and brutally beat up and injured one more, all in the span of about 15 minutes. At the time of this story, that was the most recent of his known murders, but it was later found that he actually killed a poor little 12-year-old girl between being caught and the college girl's murder. He was handsome and young and his M.O. was to be very friendly and charming, and his clean-cut appearance made women trust him. Now to my mom's story. My mother and father had moved to Tallahassee two months prior, and were living in a so-so area of apartment complexes. My dad was in school at FSU, and had a Monday science lab that would let out at unpredictable times, dependent entirely on how long that day's experiment lasted. My mom had not yet found a job and was pretty bored most of the day. She'd go walk to campus on Mondays to try and meet my dad if the timing happened to be right. But this particular day, his lab had let out before she got there and she didn't see him. 
so she walked back to their apartment. As she was walking, she turned the corner onto the street where the apartments were on the other side of the road. Just as she did this, a guy in an orange Volkswagen Beetle, a pretty rare car, at least in that color, was coming down the street toward her and leaned over and waved at her in a really excited, friendly manner. My mother was rather confused. She and my dad didn't really know anyone down there, but she gave a small wave back. They had met another young couple a week before, and for a second, she thought it might be the husband, but then thought it would be weird for him to wave so excitedly at someone he only knew a little bit. She suddenly felt really uncomfortable about it and wanted to check to see if he was still around without really obviously turning and looking. She realized if she crossed the street toward her apartment, she could get a good look to her right more naturally. As she did so, she saw the car had stopped just across the intersection she had turned the corner around initially. She could see by the lights that the guy was sitting with his foot on the brakes, and worse, that he had his head tilted up and was blatantly watching her in his rearview mirror. She also knew the particular duplex he was stopped in front of was vacant, so there was no way he was waiting for someone or anything like that. My mom was thoroughly freaked out and trying to figure out what to do at this point, as there were no cell phones back then and thus no one she could call. But there was a nice thick tree up ahead a bit, and she realized that if she walked behind it, she could then walk away at such an angle that the tree would block his vision of her for quite a while, and he wouldn't know exactly where she was. She did this, and after getting a decent bit further, she peeped around the blocked line of vision, and his car was gone. She figures he realized she was onto him, and didn't want to deal with the woman putting up a fight. As I said at the beginning, Ted Bundy was caught two days later in an orange beetle. That was stolen two blocks from my parents' apartment. Bundy would apparently often return cars he'd stolen after using them to murder people, and my mom thinks that's what he was planning on doing. But he changed his mind, and that's why he was back in the area. So yeah, thankfully my mother was smart and not killed by Ted Bundy. And thus, I exist. Hooray. A few years ago, coming home from college, I was sitting on the bus for the daily hour-long ride. This middle-aged man was sitting a row of seats away from me, in a way that had him almost facing me. I had noticed he was staring at me for quite a while now. It was making me gradually more uncomfortable, so at one point, I looked up at him and gave him an awkward smile slash face to let him know I had seen him, that he could stop doing that. I thought if he realized I was aware of this whole time, he would be embarrassed to be caught. Obviously, he had to take it as an invitation and smiled back. He then asked me if I believed in God. I shook my head and said, No, sorry, with a polite laugh, and took my phone out to go onto social media to make it clear that I did not want to talk. He stayed quiet and continued staring at me for a few seconds. He then got up and decided to come sit right next to me. He was very obviously waiting for me to look at him, you know, the very awkward close-up stare while I was very obviously not interested. I can see you're very kind and sweet, is what he then said to me. Now, because I was raised to always be polite, and because I was too young to know how to stand my ground, I didn't stop him, so he carried on. The entire interaction felt like he was trying to convince me to join him in his community. He would tell me about how he knows kind people like me aren't appreciated enough in this world, but in his church, they are understood and loved. He would say that God chose him to look for other souls to be rescued, and that he would see God's plan in the way I appeared to him. He told me I might not know it yet, 
but I was searching for God in my life, and it showed in the way I let him talk to me. It lasted maybe 10 to 15 minutes, and the whole time he was calm and confident, like he was teaching me something, very close to my face, showing a reassuring smile, looking into my eyes, and his hand was placed on my seat in a way that his arm was touching my back. I was unsettled and very uncomfortable. I would look at him and quickly nod sometimes, in hopes he would get the message that I'd had enough. I got it, and he could leave me alone. He ended up asking me if I had a Facebook, and gave me a small paper card with a phone number, the name of his community, something like God's true words or message, and also a Facebook link to a private group. I looked it up later on. He encouraged me to give him slash them a call, and then he left. I hate the fact that I have a story to even post to this subreddit, but it goes to show you, when living in a major metropolitan city, you never know what walks of life you will pass by or drop off. So, a bit of backstory. In 2003, I was a 16-year-old employee at an urban clothing store here on the south side of Chicago. At the time, I had a manager who was in his early 20s by the name of Anthony. Anthony was pretty arrogant and obnoxious, but overall he was a pretty cool guy. I used to kind of give him shit and tease him when it came to approaching the ladies, because he always seemed timid or too aggressive. I was, and still am a ladies man, so yeah, I was being an asshole. After working at this place for about three months, Anthony asks me if I would drop him off at home. It wasn't that far from the direction I was headed in so I dropped him off maybe twice a week for the next month or so. Now, let me tell you, these car rides were quite uncomfortable. This guy, as much as we spoke at work, would not speak and sort of just kept looking straight. It got to the point that his awkwardness went from entertaining, I was 16, most awkward people are interesting to teenagers, to straight creepy. Fast forward three to four years later, I'm watching the news as they go into detail of a horrific crime committed by a Comcast installation worker. Apparently, the Comcast worker entered two homes he was due for an installation, sexually assaulted, beat, and strangled two women. The real unfortunate thing is, this happened on two different occasions, and after the first murder, the gentleman was arrested and questioned, but released and sent back to work which allowed him to strike again. As the picture of his mugshot flashed the screen, I froze. It was Anthony. Now, growing up on the south side of Chicago, I have grown up and befriended a fair share of people who grew up to be murderers. But this took the cake. So, Anthony Triplett, let's not meet again, because that'll mean I'm in jail with you. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Grant Broughton. Nix, the wandering triathlete, Talara Williams, Mox, Roe Harper, Pretty in Pink, Johnny C, Kim Thompson, Kristen Collins, Anne Sherry Smith, Felicia Taysher, Shannon Evans, Amy Chambers, Adam Ernest, Alexander Wilson, Calamity Jade, Maureen Baumgartner, Tyson Allen, Tyler Wilson, Alexandria Bannock, It's Me, Ryan, Trevor Blockley, Cassandra Bricker-Wyatt, Paddy's niece, 
Adiara Yasharala L, Deb Foster, Kathleen Greer, Lynn Meeks, Ryan, Chris Lawson, Joe Jordan, Lise Mendoza, Brooke, Nikki Bundrant, Thomas Doolittle, The Tijara, Brooke, Nikki Bundrant, Thomas Doolittle, Jennifer Chamberlain, Denise Watson, Zero Byte, Erica Asir, Forgotten Ruins TV, Night Shadow, Healing with Ev, Talisha Kluss, Donna Cox, Holy Crusader, Sheila Grant 44, Julie Hebbins, Stephanie McLaren, Janet Mills Rice, Bob Jeff, Master Dom Howie, Denise Watson, Roz, Cassandra Wyatt, Travis Smith, Zoe D, Kat Philbin, Melissa Friesen, Lorna Clark, Kathy Richmond, Natasha Hensley, Jaleesa Ferguson, Leah McBride, Emily Pearson, Tyler Wilson, Lynn Meese, Kristen Birdo, Shaz, Betty Brantley, Candice Lee, Africa Winfield, Becca, Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012, Katrina King, Hospital Cakewalk, Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruiz, Annalisa Petri, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Matt is a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Off, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Adwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindon, Z. Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zafferano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicki Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.